My name is Bob Ward. I'm the Policy and Communications Director at the Grantham Research Institute on Climate Change and the Environment. Um, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to this special event with our uh, speaker, um, uh, Montek Singalualia, who's going to speak to us about climate change policy for developing countries. We're very lucky to have here uh, a distinguished panel who are joining us in person and on Zoom. And we have an audience in person and on Zoom. So a truly hybrid, virtual, uh, in-person experience today. Um, before I introduce the panel, I'm just gonna go through some uh, logistics, mainly for the benefit of those who are in the room. We are not expecting a fire drill at any point. So if you hear an alarm, please leave to the, to the nearest available exit. Uh, if you have a mobile phone with you, please switch it to silent or turn it off so it doesn't interrupt proceedings. Very good, so we're going to get going. I'm gonna introduce the uh, panel first of all, and, and then go through the order of proceedings. So our guest speaker, of course, is Montek Singalawalia, who is, of course, an economist and former deputy chairman of the Planning Commission of India. His talk today is based on chapter nine in this very interesting book, Envisioning 2060, uh, the people in the room here have, uh, are lucky enough to all have a free copy on their seats uh, to take away with them. Uh, we're going to have a comment from Harinda Kohli, who was the lead editor on the book and is founding director and chief executive of the Emerging Markets Forum. With us here, we also have uh, Professor Lord Nicholas Stern, who is the IG Patel Professor of Economics and Government here at the London School of Economics and Political Science. And we have um, joining us um, on the, I'm just going to share my screen here. Uh, we have um, Danai Kiriokopoulou, who is a se senior policy fellow here at the Grantham Research Institute at LSE. And we have Mike Hemsley, who is uh, joining us uh, from the Energy Transition Commission. So we're going to start, actually I'm going to stop sharing my screen to begin with. And we're going to start with um, some introductory remarks from Harinda Kohli, who's going to uh, briefly introduce the book. So Harinda, if you'd like to come up. Thank you very much, Bob. Good morning to everyone. Actually, good afternoon, because I think we are five minutes past 12. Um, very special thanks to Nick. It's a pleasure to be at your home base, London School of Economics. Um, those of you who are in the room here, you have a copy of this book, um, which we released two weeks ago in Nick's presence in Paris at the 15th meeting of Emerging Markets Forum in, at Banque de France. Uh, I must say um, that the book was published, went to publishers just before these tragic events in uh, Ukraine. So it doesn't take into account this upheaval in geopolitics. Um, the book was authored by 20 editors and 20 authors from around the world. And I do hope you will have an opportunity to go through the book. It is almost 500 pages long, has 19 chapters on various subjects of, in our view, major interest to emerging markets, indeed world as a whole. So it's impossible to summarize them in these brief introductory remarks. Um, but let me make five quick points before Montek speaks. Um, first, the book highlights the fact, in our view, that the post-pandemic world will look very different than where we were in 2019. 
And it's not just because of the pandemic, but what the pandemic has done is highlight many underlying trends which are already present. And you may wish to look at the book, why we think the world in after the pandemic subsides um, will be very different, including because of technological changes, how we will work, but some other basic changes are taking place in the world. Second, the book overall takes a fairly optimistic view of where we might be in 2060. The book, it takes a long-term perspective of the world, not the short-term events. Why it takes a relatively optimistic view of the world. We believe that the world economy and societies would be driven by technological developments, which are taking place, but also innovations which are undergoing, as well as developments in emerging and developing parts of the world. At the same time, the book presents multiple scenarios um, based on modeling done actually by Harpal Kohli here. We have a model of the world economy, 190 plus countries. But overall, the book presents two contrasting scenarios. A pretty optimistic one of the world, what the world can achieve, what is the potential, but also a, a pessimistic scenario. And the difference between the two scenarios uh, are very dramatic, pretty dramatic. What will be the major points, major issues, which will determine as to where the world might be uh, 40 years from today, 35 years from today? In our view, three main issues will determine the dis difference between these two scenarios. One, about which Montek will talk about, is climate change which is very close to Nick's heart. Second is the issue of rising inequalities within the countries. It's not only an economic issue, it's also social and political issues. Unless these inequalities are tackled, like climate change, we could have a lot of unrest, political and social. And third is the issue of productivity productivity at the global level, productivity at the national level. And that will be determined how the world, the countries and the world as a whole masters technological innovations. And that makes a big difference also between the optimistic and pessimistic scenario. Based on these three issues, climate change, inequality, and productivity, how countries and the world as a whole tackle these uh, will make a huge difference as I mentioned. And also based on that, there could be a big difference between the world as a whole, the le leading regions in the world, the advanced countries of today, plus East Asia on one hand, and the three lagging regions of the world, Africa, Latin America and the Middle East. We might end up seeing two divergent worlds. Advanced countries of today, that is North America, Europe and East Asia, pulling ahead, pulling forward and the three lagging regions stagnating. That could cause what I'll call an unstable world. Let me paint a picture for you before I stop. The three leading regions, North America, Europe, and East Asia, between them will have roughly 6 billion people by 2060. They will have income levels, perhaps equal to or higher than 
the income levels of Southern Europe today, 6 billion people. On the other hand, Africa, Latin America, and the Middle East will be lagging two divergent parts of the world. That could be quite worrisome. That is what it has stake. Would the world be able to tackle climate change, inequality, and productivity or not? With that, let's talk about climate change. One thing. Uh, for, uh, I invite Montek up. We're just going to make a slight adjustment on the Zoom screen. For those observant ones of you, that was not Alison Peacock. That was, of course, Harinda Kohli. <laughs> Okay, it should be okay. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, so thank you, Herinda, for that introduction. It's now my great pleasure to uh, invite up uh, Montek, and I'm going to share the screen, which should give us the image that uh, we need. Just bear me one moment. There we go. I should have done myself. I'm not used to it. I'm in the middle of the schedule before. Goodness. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Nick. Thanks. Great pleasure, as always, uh, sharing a stage with you. Um, you've already got the outline of the book, and I do recommend that you read it because actually it's very rich in all those different chapters. Uh, I should warn you that in the rest of this session, we're just going to talk about one chapter, but I think it's an important one. Uh, you know, I want to break down this presentation into three bits. One, I, I want to share my thinking on why I think what happened in COP26 was important uh, and how much does it sort of present a complete agenda. Uh, second, I want to ask, the, I want to address the question, um, what do developing countries have to do to achieve what they promised? And the third part is going to be, how do they do that? And what does it imply for financing? So these are the three distinct parts. The first is very simple. Uh, you know, developing countries traditionally used to be criticized for not wanting to or not being willing to do enough on climate change. The usual approach uh, that uh, was described as the developing countries' approach was that you guys cause the problem, don't expect us to sort it out, you have to do everything that needs to be done. And to be honest, that was indeed the attitude in an environment where developing countries felt that they have a lot of development to do. Uh, I mean, all these global sustainable development goals all implied uh, a certain achievement of growth and growth implied energy and energy implied emissions. And so it was felt that you have to accept the fact that if we're gonna grow, uh, we're gonna have, we're gonna generate more emissions. I think what changed that was the perception that we could delink emissions from growth. And that was really on the technological side most importantly, that you could now actually generate a lot of energy you need without burning fossil fuels. I mean, that technical breakthrough was happening pretty continuously, but it's only relatively recently that it has been recognized that th this new method of generating electricity is economically uh, potentially viable. I mean, the moment that happened, it made sense for developing countries also to make a commitment that they were going to reduce their own emissions. And, you know, in Paris in 2015, 
it was said to be a breakthrough that developing countries for the first time agreed to reduce the emissions intensity of GDP, which earlier they had never done. But of course, reducing the emissions intensity of GDP doesn't mean reducing emissions. Because if you're going to reduce, in India's case, you're going to reduce the emissions intensity by 45% or something over a period when GDP is going to increase by four times, then emissions are going to increase by whatever, 40, 45%. It's, it's in COP26 that the developing countries, all of them, for the first time said, yes, we have to go down to zero. The big ones, uh, China said it, uh, they said we'll go down to zero by 2060. India said we'll go down to zero by 2070. I mean, we're behind China, so there was some logic to that. Uh, Indonesia also said 2060. And I think there's less importance in terms of what exact date, because frankly, 2060, 2070 is a long way away. And my feeling is that once people recognize that this is possible, it will be easy to adjust targets to whatever is reasonable. The question we have to ask is that while this is very important, is it enough? And that is a really worrying uh, question because the chart which will disappear at the end of this very brief uh, uh, focusing on it, the chart gives you a picture of uh, what, is, what has happened and what is likely. Now, the, the red line represents temperature and the continuous red line represents what has happened in the past and the dashed and dotted versions represent the future. Uh, the blue line represents CO2 concentration in the atmosphere steadily rising and the dashed and dotted versions of the blue line represent what these things would look like under two different assumptions about how much we have to do. Now, the top uh, dashed lines, green, uh, I mean, blue and red, represents what people thought <clears throat> would happen after the Paris Agreement. I mean, the Paris Agreement was widely described as breakthrough and all the rest of it. It's always good in international uh, negotiations to describe every bit of progress as a breakthrough. These things are very difficult, but it's all, I mean, so therefore you want to celebrate what you've got, but it's good to take a realistic assessment of what's happening. So actually it is the dashed lines that show what Paris would have done to CO2 emissions and also to temperature. CO2 is being uh, tracked on the left-hand side and temperature increase on the right-hand side. And um, you can see that uh, in the case of the dashed line, the red line, that is the Paris, post-Paris, uh, position, um, we were actually heading for a 2.8 degree C increase above pre-industrial levels. So the fact that if you hadn't done anything, it would have been worse uh, is important, but was by no means an acceptable outcome. What would be acceptable is if you could go to the dotted lines, because that is what is consistent with a sort of below 1.5, I think this is calibrated for 1.4 degrees C increase above pre-industrial levels, most of which, by the way, has already happened. Uh, and I think what COP26 has done, although it's historic, the developing countries have said we'll go to zero, COP26 is headed for something, it could be a 2.4 degree increase, maybe a little bit less than that. So we're somewhere in the middle, and the bottom, the lower part of the graph tells you where we've got to be. So, I mean, the amount of bending that has to be done of that curve is humongous. So that would be, that is true even after you take credit for COP26. And that assumes that the countries concerned will actually do what they said in COP26. They still have to do more. And to be fair, the Glasgow Pact recognized this and called upon all the countries to look at this again in the next COP, which is going to happen in October. And hopefully every country uh, will have to do something. I mean, this is a very important thing for developing countries. It's important to recognize that the gap between what needs to be done and what should be done doesn't have to be met by developing countries. 
is as much of an obligation on the part of the developed countries to do more than what they've promised. And what we say in the paper, various uh, bases for saying it, which is simply fairness, et cetera, et cetera, that the developed countries really, instead of going to net zero by 2050, ought to go to net zero by 2040. And developing the developing countries also ought to advance their own target dates. I mean, I've suggested, we've suggested that maybe uh, NEDS for China, it should be brought in from 2060 to say 2050. And for India, it should be brought in from 2070 to 2060. You know, end dates are also not very important because it's no good remaining at high levels and promising to go down in the last three years. I mean, the real issue is how much of the available carbon space uh, are individual countries going to be allowed to fill? And we've got some calculations, I won't go into that. But essentially, uh, if, you accept, if you accept the fact that China and India need to move their uh, end dates closer uh, to today, uh, they would also need to reduce their emissions in a reasonable way towards those end dates. And then one can start discussing what that should be. All this will be picked up in COP27. Now, as a prelude to the rest of the uh, conference, I want to say that you know COP27 can only succeed if developing countries feel that the developed countries are serious about the other part of the bargain, which is really helping developing countries achieve their objectives financially. And I'll come to that on the third bit, but that's the linkage. Uh, unless we can see some progress there, uh, it's unlikely that anyone in COP27 will say, okay, we improve our targets. In fact, in my view, the first thing that should happen is the developed countries should say, right, instead of 2050, we are now aiming at 2040. Even then, it may, it, the announcement may come too late, for developing countries to actually change their position, but at least it'll put something in the discussion space that can be picked up a year later. And remember, these are 30 year objectives. So what happens in any one year is not absolutely crucial. Anyway, we can turn this one off now. Thanks. Uh, now let me go to the second part uh, of what I want to say, which is actually a surely important. And that is that, uh, can we, can we see the developing countries actually reducing their emissions? Because until very recently, after all, they were saying it's not possible. Well, I think we can. And the principal reason for that is what technology has done. Uh, very roughly in the paper, what we outline is a sort of um, action on the demand side and action on the supply side. Action on the demand side consists of action to improve energy efficiency. And that can be done in virtually every area where energy is being used. And historically, we know that energy efficiency can in fact increase quite substantially. And I mean, we need to explore what we can do in different areas. The second is of course, um, on the demand side, uh, get away from direct use of fossil fuels and electrify the sector. Uh, the best, best known example, of course, is transport, where you now have, you can't avoid, uh, you can't open a newspaper without seeing Mr. Elon Musk's face, and he's holding out the prospect that nobody will ever need to fill gas in their cars, which is good. Uh, and that means that at least that particular sector will rely on electricity. Now, that's not much use if the electricity is going to come from coal burning. So while on the demand side, these things are important, on the supply side, uh, the trend towards electrification must be accompanied by a complete change in the supply side of the energy sector, getting rid of coal-based electricity and putting in renewable electricity. Now that raises the issue, is it feasible? Well, many developing countries, certainly including India, all are doing that. And we are now finding that we, we, we have expanded the capacity for renew, renewable energy. Uh, we are finding that there's a lot of private sector interest in it. I mean, India's renewable energy capacity has increased from something like six gigawatts in 2005 to about 111 last year. And 95% of this has been from the private sector. 
So the notion that this can't be done unless the government invests, et cetera, is not actually true. If you can have a viable model, and we'll come to what that means, it can be done and there's enough private sector investment uh, uh, willing to do it. But of course, uh, 111 is not what our target was. I mean, our target was actually 175. So it's one of those classic cases that if you want to be enthused by, is there some progress? There's lots of stories. But if you want to ask the question, is the rate of progress enough? It isn't. Uh, according even to our own, for our own targets. I mean, for the same thing is happening on electricity. Um, we have electric vehicles in India, two wheelers, three wheelers, even cars, even electric buses. Uh, many uh, cities are now ordering electric buses, uh, but you know, the total sale of vehicles, which is electric is still 2%. Now, if you want to become, uh, if India wants to go uh, net zero by 2070, maybe even by 2060, then you know the entire uh, uh, percentage of new vehicle sales that should become electric has to be 100%, not by 2060, but sufficiently before 2060, so that the existing vehicle fleet gets kind of phased out. And that in effect means giving the Indian automotive industry a signal that you're not going to be allowed to sell any internal combustion engine car uh, after, let us say, 2030. Uh, that's one element of what needs to be done if you want to make this transition. Because the other big thing is public transport. That is relatively easier because the decision to go electric or not electric is essentially a governmental decision at different levels of government. And I mean, many good things are happening there. I mean, for example, uh, railways. You know, India has the, I think is the third or fourth largest railway network in the world. And almost 86 or 87% of the track is now electrified. And the expectation is that 100% will be electrified within two years. Now, electrifying the track is not the same thing as electrifying all traction because we have a hell of a lot of diesel engines uh, in the fleet, plus factories producing diesel engines. So somebody has to decide, uh, how are we going to accelerate the phasing out of these diesel engines? How are we going to convert the existing diesel engine producing factories, which only started uh, two years ago? Uh, can we convert them to electric? Can we convert existing diesel engines into electric? And efforts are being made to do all, all uh, do, to, to act in each of these areas. So in the paper, we go to great lengths to explain that in many sectors, like for example, the power sector, the transport sector, the building sector and industries, it is possible to actually electrify so you change the composition of demand and in the power generating sector, it's possible to bring in renewable electricity. That raises a whole lot of market and institution related issues because uh, if you go in for renewable electricity, it's going to be intermittent. So if you're going to have intermittent electricity, how do you make it more steady? Uh, that brings in batteries. Again, it brings in technology. What's the cost of batteries? How much is it going to fall? And you know, it's easy to, it's easy to imagine that over the next 20 years, there will be technical progress in these areas, which will make all these things uh, more effect, more usable, uh, more competitive than they are now. Uh, that said, uh, I think one of the critical things that we'll, we will have to address is all evidence suggests that we will not be able to do without fossil fuel use entirely. In fact, one of the problems with balancing renewable energies uh, uh, sources is that the best form of balancing could well be uh, gas turbines, which are uh, worked in a paired arrangement so that they ramp up uh, at the time when the renewable electricity goes down. Now, these things produce uh, emissions, not as bad as coal, but they do produce emissions. And that's where I think uh, the technological breakthrough in carbon capture and storage, which is not just an Indian problem, it's, it's a problem for the whole world. Lots of work being done. And you know the ease with which India can go and take advantage 
of renewable energy is much greater if one can say that in the in the technology space carbon capture and storage has become economic now whether it will or not i have no idea but you know elsewhere in the world i mean if this is a global problem in which the energy companies of the world are concentrating one would hope that you will see some progress there'll be any number of uh, problems there but that's in the nature of the uncertainty associated with technical progress what we need though is a policy that sort of assumes that this can happen and make sure that when the technology breakthrough occurs we can absorb it and at the same time work out a, a, an, an energy transition now in order not to go on and on because this could easily take half an hour uh, of interesting examples. Uh, the, the main thing to draw out of this is really two or three. One, there's no single magic bullet solution. Uh, what it requires is action in a whole number of different areas. In each area, it requires mutually supportive action. The policy instruments that are deployed are not in the control of the central government alone. They're certainly not in the control of any one ministry. And they also, many of them require action at the central level, supplemented by action at the state level, and in some cases, even the local level. So it really is a whole of the economy approach. And there's nothing else uh, that we perceive on the economic agenda that requires so much coordination in new areas which hasn't happened earlier. So this will be a huge challenge for any government. And certainly I think in India, uh, I hope that uh, the government sort of recognizes that this is not just another kind of coordination problem. This probably requires a much deeper uh, effort to mutually coordinate action by different people. Um, I think another point to keep in mind is that you know it's not very useful to work out strategies for 2060 and 2070 i mean nobody knows what the technology is going to be but clearly what we need is a 10 year strategy so i think an, an operational approach would be that look we're hoping to get to whatever zero uh, carbon emissions by 2070 here's the first 10 year plan in power and buildings and so on. Nick has very often uh, uh, mentioned the issue of build buildings and that's very crucial and is connected with structural change. Because if India is going to urbanize at the rate it is, and if India is going to sort of grow at the rate it is, we would expect that the urban population of India will expand from about 370 million people now to maybe 800 million by two, uh, 2050. And these are people who will be living a totally different lifestyle and have higher income levels. So they will be into electrical appliances much more uh, than the ones are at present. So one of the simplest things, I mean, in India, heating is not the problem, cooling is the problem. So, uh, and how much of cooling is just sticking in more air conditioners as opposed to better building design? Quite a lot is in better building design. And you know, uh, many people will have told you that 70% uh, of the buildings that will exist in India, if India's growth comes up to expectations have yet to be built, the ones that will be there in 2070. So there's a huge premium in making sure that the building design in urban areas is uh, as much as possible oriented towards the first point I mentioned about, which was energy saving. So the, I mean, you know, I don't think one can chart out all these things uh, definitively for 2060, but I think we can say that, look, it's a complicated business, but for the next 10 years, this is what we're going to do. These are the parameters by which progress should be judged, and we should monitor, the, monitor them all the time and make sure that we are kind of getting there. I mean, for example, in the case of sale of electrical vehicles, it's not going to be 100% uh, by 2030. But can it go up from two to X? Maybe X is only 10 or 15, but we should have a number. And against that number, one can judge, are we getting there or not? So having said that, I, I, don't, I won't go into this, take it up in questions. I just want to say a few things on the financing side. I mentioned earlier that, you know, in the way the COP negotiations have proceeded, uh, it has always been part of the UNFCCC, 
that the bargain includes developed countries assisting developing countries in some agreed manner. Now, until very recently, since the developing countries weren't actually willing to take on any obligations, uh, the number that has stuck around is $100 billion a year of both public and private money. Now, this number was invented, pulled out of thin air, actually, in 2009 at the Copenhagen conference, when the developing countries said, well, you know, maybe we're willing to reduce emissions intensity. That's no longer the target. What they're now saying and what we expect them to do and what they'll actually have to do is even more is to actually go down to zero. So the energy transition, which they're expected to make is orders of magnitude different from what was expected in 2009 when the 100 billion was first thrown out. The fact is the 100 billion hasn't been achieved. I mean, it's going to be achieved two years later. So in a way, the, the, the financing problem is that our present efforts are nowhere near what they should be. Now, I just want to, since I know that Nick, Nick should really pronounce on all these things, so I will summarize very quickly. One is it's not easy to decide what is the additional investment needed because a lot of the investment needed is part of the structural transformation that you want anyway for achieving the uh, sustainable development goals. I mean, take the simplest example. It's not, it's not correct to regard uh, the additional investment in gigawattage of renewable energy as additional because you would have had an investment in non-renewable energy over this period. So you have to consider what's the additional investment because you're moving from conventional energy to renewable energy. But you know, if you're moving to renewable energy, you don't need coal. Whereas if you weren't moving to renewable energy, you'd be making, making a lot of investment in coal, which will no longer be needed. So to calculate what is the difference between what is what would have happened under normal circumstances and what will now happen, need to happen, that's the additional amount. I mean, there are a wide variety of numbers, but the most recent uh, from Grantham Institute itself, a paper authored by Amar Bhattacharya and others, which they claim is under the guidance of Nick Stern. So Nick, you're implicated. What it says is uh, against the 100 billion that hasn't been achieved, the additional investment needed in developing countries other than China by 2025, is 1.3 billion. Then quite sensibly, they say that, look, 1.3 billion isn't all going to come from the international community. Trillion. This trillion, trillion. I'm sorry, yeah, trillion. This is an example of Janet uh, Yellen complaining that they talk of billions when they mean trillions. And I <laughs> made exactly that mistake. Okay, 1.3 trillion. Uh, clearly, uh, a lot will have to be coming out of the domestic economy and that would be part of the restructuring that the domestic economy has to make anyway, plus the increase in investment if we want to get growth going. But you know, even if you say that, then by 2025, uh, 650 billion is supposed to come somehow domestically, and 650 billion has to be the additional. And they are proposing that this additional could come through extra bilateral funding, uh, extra multilateral funding, uh, extra non-concessional funding, and extra private sector uh, uh, investment. And you know, those numbers are really quite huge. And since Nick is going to defend them, let me just mention them in one sentence so you know the order of magnitude that we're talking about. I think what, what we are talking about is uh, that um, international bilateral support they expect could increase by 50% by 2025. And that would be an additional 100 billion, okay? Uh, international uh, multilateral support, they expect will triple. Uh, and that would be uh, an extra 125 billion or so. That's a 200% increase from the present level. And then private financial support uh, would be about 400 billion which is double what it is now. And what it is now is not just for climate change, it's the total uh, for all sectors. Now, you know, these, this is only about to be achieved by 2025. By 2030, the same paper says, uh, 
that instead of 1.3 billion increase, it needs to be three point, sorry, 1.3 trillion increase. It needs to be 3.5 trillion. So all these numbers have to be jacked up by the same amount. So that is a huge, huge target. And all I would say is uh, we ought to be clear in the short run whether there's a willingness to provide support on the level needed. And this is an important thing that will certainly come up in COP27. Now, it's just unfortunate, as Harinda pointed out, that this is happening at a time when the world is preoccupied with the immediate problems of both the pandemic and Ukraine and rebuilding and what have you. But you know, I expect, if you take an optimistic view, that these problems will recede from the public imagination, maybe by the end of this year. Uh, and then we can look at the longer term thing again. So what technically what can be done in the course of the next year is very difficult. I mean, the, Britain, for example, has you cut multilateral allocation, allocation for multilateral assistance sharply in the current year. Uh, and uh, I don't know what's happening on the bilateral front, but it's not, it's not aid on this scale. And since everybody says that in, in NATO, certainly, that defense expenditure is going to be jacked up, and I can understand the compulsion, the idea that defense expenditure is going to be increased and this sort of assistance is going to increase, well, prospects are not very good. So I think the, the real name of the game, to my mind, is to keep the importance of this issue alive uh, in the hope that when things settle down and go to normal, people will realize that this is a much bigger threat to global security than anything that we've known before. And it would be a pity if uh, somehow we don't get uh, positive messages coming out of uh, international meetings. So I think with those words, I would probably exceeded my targeted uh, timing. All I can say is I'm happy to take questions. Please read the paper more carefully. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Montek. Uh, so we are going to come to the discussion part of the event now. Uh, what I'm going to do is invite each of the discussants in turn to react to uh, Montek's comments. And then I'm going to come to a Q&A with both the in-person and the Zoom audience. For those of you who are watching on Zoom, you will see in the bottom of your screen a Q&A function down here. Uh, so put your questions in there. Do not use the chat. You will find it's been disabled. The Q&A function allows you to put questions in and to upvote on those that you uh, are most keen on being heard, and I will read them out uh, in due course. Um, it's also helpful if you put your name and any affiliation in rather than remaining anonymous. Very good. Okay, so I'm going to start by inviting Nick Stern to offer his comments. I'm hoping this works, huh? Should be. This one works, yes? <laughs> Very good. Uh, Dan, I can, can you hear me on this one? Very good, thank you. Um, uh, first, let me thank um, Harinda and Montek for bringing us together and uh, for this book and to thank um, uh, Kamya Chowdhury and Bob Ward for looking after all this at the Grantham end. Um, so thank you very much for the four of you and everybody else who's involved. Um, I do suggest that you read the book, at least those in the room are clutching the uh, book. Uh, you can rest assured it's 200 pages shorter than the Stern Review, so it won't take you uh, very, very long, but particularly chapter nine, which is the one that we're discussing uh, today. Uh, it, it's really tremendous and the detail does matter. So please sit down and read it. I'm going to stay at a fairly high level. Um, certainly Dan I and Mike, I know um, we'll come back with much more uh, of the detail. The detail does matter and let's see how it comes out in the, in the discussion. Um, I want to, say something about the big issues, something about how to tackle them economically, and then a few words at the end on something how to tackle them uh, 
politically in the environment that uh, Montec uh, described. The first point I want to make is that whilst we talk about going to net zero by 2050, the pathway is critical. And even though it sounds like a long-term story, it is a long-term story, uh, the uh, urgency for action now is intense. Delay is extremely dangerous. The world's infrastructure will probably double in the next 15 or 20 years. Um, if it looks anything like the infrastructure we already have, so you've got a new lot of infrastructure which we're adding to what we've already got, if this new lot of infrastructure that we'll add in the next 15 or 20 years, roughly the same size we have now, if that looks anything like the infrastructure that we have now, then you could say goodbye to three degrees, let alone uh, well below two degrees or best efforts to 1.5. And um, above two degrees is immensely dangerous. Above three degrees is scarcely imaginable. And we haven't been there for um, about three million years, Homo sapiens maybe a quarter of a million years old, one quarter. So the idea that somehow we've got good at adapting to whatever comes our way is completely off the wall here because the scale of what we're talking about would just be extraordinary. When we were three degrees, it was 10 to 20 meters, sea levels 10 to 20 meters higher than uh, now. So the stakes that we're playing for and the urgency of action, we have to really keep up constantly in our uh, attention. We know it's going to be difficult. We can all rehearse the difficulties, but the answer to the question that uh, it's going to be difficult is not to slow down. That's the most dangerous and unequal response of all. We somehow have to work out ways of overcoming the difficulties. And this is a paper which is directly concerned with that. So the dangers of delay are just immense, but the rewards to getting it right are enormously attractive. You know, we have a new growth model in our hands now, we can see it. Uh, we can see many of the technologies that we're going to have to use, not all of them, of course, and we're gonna learn like mad along the way and we're gonna to have to invest in order to learn as well. But we can see this new picture of growth, we can see what's involved. It is growth, it is development, but it's one that breaks the destructive relationship between consumption and production on the one hand and our environment on the other. You don't go to net zero by having zero population, at least I hope not. You don't go to net zero by having zero consumption, at least I hope not. You go to net zero by breaking that relationship between production and consumption on the one hand and destruction of the environment on the other. And if we do, as we must, then that new model of development is enormously attractive. Rising living standards, cities where you can move and breathe, ecosystems which are robust and fruitful. We can see how to do that. Of course, it's going to be hard to get there, but that is exactly what we're talking about and what this paper is uh, about. Um, I fully with um, uh, Montec that the rich countries uh, with their history, with their assets, with their technology, with their history of emissions, of course, uh, the rich countries have strong obligations to move fast and to go to net zero before 2050. And they have strong obligations to um, uh, uh, support financially and indeed technology, although I think it's the former that's going to be more important given how fast technology is moving and where it's moving. They have a strong obligation to support financially. And it's very important that we're clear and strong about those moral uh, obli obligations. Because if they're discharged, practically we will not be able, if they're not discharged, it'd be very hard to, uh, very hard to deliver. We should remember also in thinking about timing, that developing countries have some advantages in that their infrastructure is not yet built. There's something like, I mean, you can argue about exactly what percentage, but something like 80% of India's infrastructure in 2050 will be built between now and then. So there's an advantage actually there in the leapfrogging uh, story of not going through the dirty destructive phases that the rich countries and indeed China uh, went, uh, went through. So that's the 
the, if you like, the big picture story of the urgency, uh, the, the terrible consequences if we get it wrong, um, but the gains if we get it right, and broadly on the uh, mutual duties. But obviously we don't go to net zero unless we have net zero practically everywhere since the negatives are not going to be that uh, huge. So we all have to act on this. And as uh, Montek emphasized, that is now, I think, a shared, uh, a shared understanding. The, let me turn very quickly to some of the practicalities now. The scale of investment that we need, of course, there are different numbers depending on what's included, what's in terms of countries, what's included in terms of sectors, how much you say about uh, adaptation, how much you say about natural capital. So there's a range of different numbers. Uh, one number I tend to home in on, and it's, it's consistent with what um, Montex said, is that if you look at emerging markets and developing economies outside China, and you include something for adaptation and natural capital, the scale of investments you're likely to need is probably a flow rate of about 2 trillion uh, extra in uh, 2030 relative to now. As I say, the numbers are different depending on which country is excluded, which country is included, uh, what you say about adaptation and so on. And I think it's very important to recognize that that's development investment. It's a necessary condition that that development takes place if we're to go to net zero. You can't go to net zero without making investments. You've got to invest in doing things differently. But at the same time, those investments are in development investments. They're investments with very strong returns. So you shouldn't count that only benefit that's going to net zero and that therefore they're unambiguously a cost of going to net zero because they're driving investment, they're driving development forward as Montec described. And as I described also in the, sort of the, the new picture of, uh, of growth. So these are investments we need to uh, generate and the investments we need to finance. Generating those investments requires um, the right kind of investment climate and it requires policy. Uh, in India, which is a, obviously a particular focus here today, you're not going to get the big investment in the electricity sector that you need. I mean, India's electricity probably has to go up by a factor of, of four or five between now and 2050 in order to pick up, of course, all the transport side and so on in the uh, building side that you'll need. Um, but that, uh, that investment, uh, much of which will be private sector, as, as Montec describes, is going to be very difficult without reform of the distribution companies in India which um, sadly under the Government of India Act 2035, for which I was not responsible, the, um, the electricity was unambiguously with the states, it carries through into the constitutions and we're left of course with a difficult problem where you're looking to integrate the whole story and where of course the electricity companies have been very uh, politicized uh, in the whole uh, uh, story of, of politics at the state level. So that's an observation that says the investments that we need are going to have to have the circumstances for that investment to come through. So those reforms are going to be part of the uh, story. And of course, there are questions of pricing and, and so on, which I, I, I won't go into any detail now. But first, pull that investment through. That's uh, having understood what investment is necessary. Mike and the Energy Transition Commission have done tremendous work on what investment is necessary. Pull it through, that's the story of investment, climate and country and country platforms. And then try to generate not only the scale of finance that we're talking about and Montec has described, which will involve big expansions across all the dimensions, bilateral, multilateral development banks, institutions, private sector and so on. But you've got to get the combinations of those finances right and that won't be easy um, but we do have a number of sources and it is um, bilateral and multilateral of course the biggest part private sector philanthropy now is getting interested in helping create the uh, conditions and we've got increasing potential in the voluntary carbon markets and philanthropy philanthropy and the voluntary carbon markets have the advantage that they're not debt generating you don't have to service those uh, investments, but we're going to need quite a lot of concessional bilateral money as well. Um, it's no good just saying, well, it's all too difficult and will they do it? And what we're describing is what's necessary to avoid 
the kinds of terrible damages that we can see. And then we have the problem, it's our job and everybody's job to try to make it, uh, try to make it happen. So let me turn to the last part, which is the politics of uh, all this. Now, uh, th those of us here have spent a lot of time in COPs and we've spent a lot of time in G7s and G20s. The first point I want to make is that we want, we're gonna, we're gonna, we, we need both. You cannot generate finance just through the COPs. They're very nice people, is our environment ministers, we love them dearly, but they don't have the money. The finance ministries are the ones, and they don't necessarily have very much money, but it's the finance ministries that control the money. And those uh, are going to be argued through in the international stage and a number of, in a number of fora, including the coalition of finance ministers on uh, climate uh, action, which some of us have been directly involved with, particularly Amar Bhattacharya who's on, on on the call and Nick Godfrey and others who, are, who and Dan I who are here. Um, but it's going to be in G20 type finance ministry meetings that these kind of things are driven through. That's why Janet Yellen's speech at the Atlantic Council shortly before the spring meetings in, in, uh, in DC was so important where she and uh, Montek mentioned that briefly. She opened up the uh, uh, the discussion of the increasing in the scale of lending from the MDBs. And we have to recognize that this is not minor, this is factors of increase. And we have to be clear and strong about what's uh, necessary. But of course, it's not enough for the G7, G20 to call on the MDBs to increase their lending. They have to back them when they do it, otherwise they won't do it. And that means that uh, they have to um, increase lending to capital ratios of various kinds, whether it's you know, retained earnings and equity or whether it's um, callable plus paid in, there are various ways of running those ratios, but they have to be uh, ready to back them, uh, the MDBs, as they move forward on those ratios and start lending higher numbers. Um, that will involve some extra risk that they take, but I think if you do it right, they can take that uh, extra risk without increasing their cost of borrowing to any really significant uh, extent. But they've got to be backed by the shareholders. They can't just, it's not about make shareholders making speeches to the MDBs, it's the shareholders backing the uh, MDBs. At some point too, they're going to have to face up to capital increases as well. And they, we have to be quite explicit about that. And Vera Songwe and I will be chairing a co-chairing a group that's going to try to come up with some of the suggestions for what's necessary in terms of um, financial support with a number of other people in the room um, in uh, the period before COP27. But I did want to emphasize that it's got those discussions have got to take place at the finance minister and indeed the, the prime ministerial and uh, presidential uh, levels. The geopolitics, of course, doesn't make life uh, any easier, but it doesn't, certainly doesn't make the problem go away. So we have to find ways of doing, of rising above it and keeping this big story as we deal with the terrible tragedy of the war. Here, I think that we're fortunate that India is in the presidency of the G20 next year. And keeping that, tremendous investment opportunity uh, in clear focus and asking the question, how do we take that opportunity and simultaneously avoid the terrible catastrophes in climate of getting it wrong is something where I think India is perfectly placed to take the lead. So much of it will happen in India because India is simply a big country on the way to uh, strong development. So that's where a big chunk of the investments can take place. India is also um, placed, as it were, in a politically valuable, rather neutral territory in a world of blocks. And there's a long tradition in uh, Indian history of trying to make something of that neutrality. And of course, it's the biggest, most important democracy in the world. So when you get a big picture issue of this substance, we're very fortunate and this is one that stays with us, of course, but we're very fortunate that India is in the presidency, the chair of the G20 next uh, year. Um, we're talking, of course, uh, 
with our Indian friends and the conversation within India is intense around this, as we know. Uh, we're fortunate to have two friends in the High Commission with, with us here today in, in the front row, and um, they don't need me to tell them of the importance of India's presidency of the G20. But if you situate it in where we are, it, we are the world's enormously fortunate that India is there. That leadership won't be easy, but it's hard to imagine another nation that could pull the world together around this uh, around around this story, and we're all ready, all of us, to uh, help help in that uh, in that in that process. There are lots of other things to say that this is not a moment when you should let opportunism about fossil fuels use the war to. Uh, push them somehow back to centre stage. The logic there is all wrong. You know, if, you're, if you're in a situation where the volatility and the insecurity is caused by dependence on fossil fuels, the obvious conclusion is to move harder and faster away from fossil fuels. And anything about timing and coping with the problem over the short run has to be uh, measured against uh, uh, whether it really is a crisis, short run response is being spoken about, or whether it's a longer run change of route. The longer run change of route is is dead wrong. Longer run means medium run means we have to intensify the route, move harder and faster away from fossil fuels. That's a, that's another story. But I wanted to end on the centrality of India, not only to the numbers and the story itself, and the great opportunity that India has to do things differently the great opportunity which was outlined by Prime Minister Modi in his very important speech in the first week of um, the Glasgow um, COP26, COP, uh, but also politically that India is uniquely placed, in my view, in the G20 to, to lead on all this. Thank you. I'm going to ask Montek if you'd like to respond to anything you heard from Nick. Okay, you can wait, uh, wait till we've had the uh, responses from the other discussants. So I'm going to ask Danai now if she would like to uh, give comments and then we'll follow that with Mike. So over to you, Danai. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here and I wish I could be there in person as well. I hope we can connect uh, again in future. Um, I would focus, I will focus on the finance part of the chapter in the discussion and uh, Montek you touched on that uh, briefly towards the end of your speech hopefully hopefully we can go into that uh, deeper in the discussion the chapter which I encourage everyone to read uh, makes a number of very important points in terms of the finance and, and financing the transition in developing economies it talks about the investment needs um, it presents various estimates and as uh, Professor Stern also mentioned just now depending on which countries you include in the horizon that you look at you can get various estimates on that, but what is true across all of them is that uh, we need to go above and beyond business as usual. Um, and there is a difficulty in terms of estimating that additionality and de determining what is what is the additional investment that is needed. But it is absolutely the case that a big step up will be needed uh, in business as usual. The chapter also talks about the sources of finance. Um, we need to combine them. We cannot set separate targets for separate sources. We need to consider public and private, domestic and foreign, bilateral and multilateral. And we need to need more. Uh, we need to think more smartly about combining the sources of finance. We need to make sure that two plus two gets us to um, to more than four. In this case, we need to use this um, sources of finance in combination. Uh, it also talks about the impediments to generating and mobilizing uh, finance for these investments in terms of the investment pipeline and the risks that are involved and how we can leverage the sources of finance more smartly in terms of the role of the multilateral development banks, um, focusing on sectoral lending, on the use of guarantees, on the use of more catalytic instruments, but also um, the use of special drawing rights and other sources of finance. So starting with the investment needs, uh, and I know that um, Professor Stern often likes to talk about this being the growth story of the 21st century. It is also the investment story of the 21st century. And um, this is something that is very important moment that we find ourselves in that at COP26 in Glasgow, the private sector came together very strongly to recognize this. And we very rarely have had this strong alignment and recognition from private finance that this is an investment opportunity that cannot be missed. Um, so the direction is clear um, in terms of the private sector in moving in financing this transition. I think 
pausing on, on this moment that we're in now, the window of opportunity is closing very fast. And again, you touched on that towards the end of your speech, Montek, that um, the climate crisis is worsening, but also the political economy is in a very difficult um, point right now where um, we, we are past the point of this very strong momentum that we had in Glasgow and we had a world that is perhaps more divided now. And, and, the, and Professor Stern also talks about how we need to, to move beyond that. It doesn't make the problem go away. The macroeconomic environment is also very different to the one we had in Glasgow. We are now in a in an environment where we have um, even higher inflation, where uh, energy and food prices are rising um, strongly, and where central banks are slowly raising interest rates, still very low compared to uh, what we've had um, some years ago. But but um, it's it's not. Um, we we are in a changing environment where monetary policy is tightening and the cost of debt is, is rising as well. So I appreciate the chapter was written um, before the latest events in Ukraine, but it'd be great in, in your response to hear how you think this kind of changing and closing window of opportunity is influencing this story. The chapter talks about finance. I think we need to look at finance uh, collectively as a kind of package of finance policy, but also regulation. We need to have mechanisms for individual parts of the financial system to shift. And there are uh, important market failures that the chapter recognizes in terms of uh, correcting these and making sure that the prices reflect the true cost and benefits of, um, of action and inaction. But um, going beyond that, we can, we can find mechanisms to correct that. Um, carbon pricing is still on the agenda and there's been important work uh, done on that by the OECD, the IMF and others that the report, the, the chapter also touches on. But we also need to find ways for um, the regulation to be not only a motivating factor to encourage actions and incentivize actions in a, in a particular way, but also an enabling factor and to encourage not only individual parts of the system to shift, but also the system as a whole. Um, and there is important work that needs to be done and is being done in terms of de determining and developing common standards, common regulation, the common language taxonomies, the work of central banks in greening the financial system and creating those conditions. Um, and finally, we need to also look at uh, not just the symptom of shifting finance to where it needs to go, but also over the long term, making sure that there is also uh, local sources of finance that can uh, sustainably continue uh, financing this transition. We cannot rely indefinitely on international sources of finance. This is very important given the urgency of um, action that we are facing, but we also need to strengthen local, uh, local sustainable finance and local capital markets. And that is something that requires fundamental changes. Uh, and perhaps we don't have the time to focus exclusively on that now. And we need to make use of all the sources of finance that we have. But we also need to look at how to strengthen uh, dom the domestic banking system. The chapter talks about the role of pension funds and sovereign wealth funds. And um, the, um, the great thing about these sources of finance, about institutional investors, is that they can bring scale, but they also require scale in order to invest. So we also need to look at beyond the mechanisms that um, MDBs can, um, can operate in terms of uh, going beyond the risk, putting in place guarantees um, that can help uh, bring finance in where risks are high in perhaps the more technological or geographical frontiers where risks are very high, we also need to look at how can we really scale finance inside those frontiers. So how can we find, uh, how can we scale up instruments like sustainable bonds, green blue bonds that can bring in investors at scale? Uh, because the main, a big issue is the high cost of capital that emerging and developing economies are facing, which uh, is, is creating this perception of risk uh, that, that development banks can help very strongly on. So thank you very much. I'll stop there and look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much indeed, Danai, uh, for those detailed comments on the investment and finance aspects of Montek's chapter. We'll now move on to Mike Hemsey. Uh, just a reminder, if you're watching on Zoom, you can put your questions in the Q&A, and I'll come to those shortly. But uh, over to you, Mike. Thanks very much, Bob, and, and thanks very much, Dr. Alawalia, for such an interesting talk. Um, I'm Mike, uh, Head of Analysis of the Energy Trans Transitions Commission. We're a coalition of global leaders trying to call for really ambitious decarbonisation uh, uh, globally. 
Uh, at the risk of being boring, I'm also going to talk about the finance stuff, but that's partly because I find found the stuff in the chapter so fat, so stimulating on this. And I think ultimately the chapter and, and your talk today clearly highlighted a very important message, and it's that it's taken more than a decade to get $100 billion per year in climate finance flowing from the developed world to the developing world. And the other realization is, well, that's fundamentally not enough, and it's far from being enough. And I, and I think what this, this book helps stimulate is the conclusion that needs to agree what needs to be enough and then quickly move towards funding that vision um, so, so that we can clearly get moving on it this, this decade. Might be enough and, and what some of the numbers said, including, including our own. I think different analyses are circling in on what the right number will be here, but whatever it is, it, it's big. We have a neat way of getting around the uh, the additional investment question that you highlight there. And we just calculate total investment instead and, and don't point to what the additional might be needed. That, that, that can be helpful. I think if, if you clarify the, the total number and then track flows in aggregates, that, that can give you a sense of, of, what, of what's flowing. So our total number is that globally, we need to invest around 4 trillion a year in clean energy. And we're investing something in the order of 1 trillion a year today. So, so there's a big gap in between. What's that investment for? So our estimates include some of the most ambitious scenarios for the scale of wind, solar, and green hydrogen build out that are out there. In, indeed, the kind of scenarios that would see India moving from building around 10 gigawatts of renewables uh, per year today, which uh, is a similar order of magnitude to what the UK has built to, over the last decade, um, moving quickly to building 30 gigawatts a year of renewables this decade and far, far more beyond that as well as the other, all the other investments like energy efficiency and electrification, as, as you rightly highlight, Dr. Alawalia. But crucially, the gap between, much of the gap between that 4 trillion and 1 trillion is investment in developing countries. And, and you note that that could be an additional 1 trillion when, when you include adaptation finance within it. And, and indeed, the, the range that, that we seem to be seeing across this is uh, around 1 to 2 trillion per year need to be realized by 2030, spanning both mitigation and adaptation. The in interesting point that you point to is around 40% of this investment may come from finance within development. Priority, the 60% that's left, which is, which is a huge figure, may need to come from international sources of private, and in some cases, public finance as well. And in effect, this 60% that you point to will become the new $100 billion a year number that the COP process needs to be aiming for. And the key thing for me is that without us reaching this, without us meeting the 60%, without this finance scaling up in this decade, we're actually gonna miss our climate objectives, not just in these countries, but, but for the world. And we're also miss, miss a lot of the co-benefits, including development that come alongside realizing these objectives. And that's just if we miss the actual investment numbers we're talking about as well. At the Energy Transitions Commission, we we're talking about investment numbers, but we also add on some critical payments that we think are required on top of these investment numbers, which we think are really key to, the, to keeping one and a half degrees alive if they could be realized this decade. And another one is one that you, you mentioned, Dr. Alawalia, and that's a, a critical activity that won't stop unless we pay someone to actually stop it. And that's burning coal in power generation, particularly where coal continues to be cheaper than the cost of, of renewables, which is the case we think this decade in some limit to some limited extent. And the other, the other activity you need to pay people for is uh, stopping deforestation as well. Both of those could add another 100 billion or even more per year each to, to the investment numbers we're talking about. And, and these things are, are things which, which are starting to be on the table. But we're far from seeing the amount of finance that's required in order to flow to these things. I, I think, in the chapter of your book, you offer some really exciting thoughts in this space and do provide a clear way forward in how we start to mobilize uh, some of this finance. I was particularly interested in the recommendations around the, around the role of multilateral development banks and the special drawing rights as well. And ultimately their role in helping to leverage a much larger flow of finance to emerging markets and, and, and developing markets this decade. But my question to you then is, is, is given this gap in funding between the 100 billion year number and, and something like the 600 billion year number that you point to potentially being required from international sources of finance, how optimistic are you of us being able to move the needle on this 100 billion dollars 
a, a year number by, by COP27 or COP28? Uh, and what are the steps that need to happen for us to start, mo start moving that conversation beyond the 100 billion towards the much higher number that we think we need to aim for? And then we really need to rush to mobilize capital towards if we're actually going to get on track to this this decade. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Mike. And uh, I'm going to uh, invite Montek to respond to what he's just heard from the discussants, and then I'll come to the audiences on Zoom and in the room. So over to you, Montek. Thanks very much. <clears throat> thank you, Bob. Um, well, uh, let me thank the discussants, uh, especially for the number of points where they seem to be agreeing with what we said in the paper. Uh, I just want to pick up a few points, uh, which I think a specific response is needed. Uh, Nick made the point that perhaps India could play an important role uh, because India will have the G20 presidency next year. Uh, in the paper, which was written before the Ukraine crisis exploded, uh, we had said that uh, Indonesia is the G20 president this year. India will be the G20 president next year, and then Brazil would be the G20 president the year after that. And we had hoped that, you know, with three emerging market countries uh, at the helm of the G20 affairs, they would be able to focus attention on what needs to be done. Now, of course, uh, the Ukraine developments have somewhat destabilized uh, the G20 as an effective force I'm not making a, a prediction about what will happen, but right now, clearly, uh, ev events suggest that it's not uh, as homogeneous a force as we would like. But I'm still hopeful that uh, if by the end of this year, towards the end of this year, uh, the Ukraine crisis, if not actually solved, appears at least to be contained and to moving towards some process which would let the world also focus on other issues, then the whole question of the G20 uh, playing a larger role does become relevant. But uh, as Nick said, you know, one of the problems with the COP uh, is that they're not the ones that make decisions on the money. Uh, similarly, if the G20 process is a little bit broken at the moment, then really it's the G7 that becomes the group that where you can bring leadership to bear. Uh, there's no internal tension in that group. Uh, we are, of course, not members of the group, though we are occasionally invited to join it. So I would say that uh, if we had to have uh, a mobilization of opinion in favor of fixing the financial obstacles to better action on climate change, uh, that focus should be in the G7. Uh, I think Japan chairs the G7 next year. So anyone who is uh, pushing for changes of ideas, academic uh, institutions, thinkers, etc., uh, should direct, uh, somehow mobilize and get the G7 to respond to some of the questions, suggestions that have been discussed and that we've made. I mean, I completely agree with the point that Danae raised that, you know, we need a multiplicity of instruments. It's not going to be coming from any one source. It's going to be public. It's going to be private. It's going to be international, bilateral. Yes, uh, the, the scale of need so much exceeds the availability that it's virtually impossible to think that somebody pushing in a particular area should be held back saying, no, no, you shouldn't be the principal people pushing. Right now, I think whoever wants to do something should be encouraged to do it. You know, I'm a little concerned on the multilateral front. I mean, historically, uh, there was a consensus amongst the richer countries that it was the multilateral development institutions that would become the principal source of lending uh, for development. I don't mean to say, multi when I say multilateral development institutions, you've got the World Bank, you've got the EIB, you've got the ADB, you've got the... Uh, well, you've got the African Development Bank and the Latin American Bank and so Inter-American Development Bank. Taking them all together, uh, refocusing them is important. Finding ways of increasing their lending, which actually minimizes the fiscal burden on the donor countries, uh, 
That's very important. And I completely agree with Nick that one of the simplest ways of doing that is to have a big pledge on callable capital, but with a smaller proportion of paid in capital so that the actual fiscal burden at any particular time is relatively low. But the institution is borrowing on the fact that there is callable capital. But you know, all of this requires a political consensus that these really are the institutions that can deliver. And you know, I have a feeling looking at it, I mean, I'm neither in government nor in the multilateral institutions that I've been in both. I don't think from the developing country point of view, there is any move away from multilateral institutions. But I fear that for the developed countries, there is a distinct erosion of support for multilateral uh, financing institutions. Now, whether, that's, uh, whether that can be altered, we will of course say it should be altered, we meaning the developing countries. But I think the push has to come more from within the developed countries that it's a mistake uh, to back off. Now, you know, if the concern is fiscal, that can be taken care of by various types of innovative methods of financing, ratios of callable capital to paid in capital. You could even create new instruments of risk guarantees, et cetera, which would enable these institutions to mitigate risk and bring the private sector into it. I mean, I agree with what Dane said, and uh, this is one of the big things in COP that the G fans the group of private sector financial people, for the first time they turned up in COP, probably more of them were present in COP than in Davos. So there is a change of mood. How to, cap how to capitalize on that change of mood is the open question. And I do think that you know, some success stories are critical. Now you might ask, it's relevant to ask, what do the developing countries have to do? I mean, one important thing is that they should not have prejudices against foreign investment. But to be honest, on that area, the developing countries have changed hugely. I mean, I can't speak for all developing countries, but as far as India is concerned, there is absolutely no negative feeling about foreign investment in any of these areas, uh, whether it's uh, getting into investment in uh, renewable energy or into the components that go into it, making batteries, uh, wafers, chips, you name it. Uh, as far as government policy is concerned, they're saying you're welcome. So the old argument that you know you want a public sector-led strategy uh, and we think it should be private sector-led, that's not really true. Let me say that the public sector has a big role to play in making all this happen. I mean, for example, it, I'm again now making a specific example for India. Uh, we are well endowed in terms of possible exploitation of renewable resources. It happens that most of these resources would be in the sort of uh, in the West and the South. So we would need to build a transmission system that can take the energy generated and distribute it to the rest of the country. That kind of thing probably is what the public sector has to do. Public sector corporations is very difficult uh, to set up transmission systems. Though in a, we are, I'm producing, a, we are producing a version of this paper, which is very India specific. And in that we say that, look, uh, uh, the problems of land acquisition, which very often stymie any effort to build a, a transmission structure could be bypassed by the central government taking it up or one of its institutions, leaving all the uh, generation to the private sector. That's feasible. I think it's also possible to bring in the private sector into distribution much more than we've done. And for India in particular, the fact that India's energy electricity system at the distribution end is loss making is a huge risk for private investors. Now, uh, successive governments for the last 15 years have recognized this, tried to improve the system. There is even some private sector distribution uh, companies in operation. My own view is that, and I say this to state, this is not a central government matter, this is a state government matter in India. I have consistently said to all state governments, whenever I get a chance, that you should just privatize part of your distribution system, if nothing else to show or see whether the privatized version does better than the public sector one. I mean, there are a lot of people who say that the public sector is just as efficient and potentially that's true. I mean, the same managers, the same engineers, 
But the question is how much political interference is there? And you know, it is true that if you privatize the system, you can never stop political interference, but the system fights against it as best it can. If it's a public sector system, you can't expect it to fight against political interference. So that's something the state governments have to do. I think the developing countries, the issue of pricing was raised and is very relevant for coal. The fact is, and we mentioned this in the paper, the IMF has put forward a proposal for carbon pricing, uh, a sort of internet, a carbon tax, which has a nice uh, aspect of an element of progressivity in the sense that they say India should have a tax of whatever, $25 per ton of carbon, and the United States should have a tax of 50 or $70 per ton of carbon. Now, quite honestly, uh, I mean, India is unlike any developing country is unlikely to do it unless the advanced countries give a lead. But frankly, if the advanced countries give a lead, I would strongly recommend that we should do it in India. No question. And believe me, if we were to impose a $25 tax uh, per ton of carbon dioxide, there would be an immediate switch in terms of the relative costs of coal versus renewables, including, including <clears throat> retiring prematurely, if you like, old coal plants. But if, if, if this price correction is not made, then you're, really, then you're really pushing against the market because the cost of coal is not fully reflected in the low price that uh, the electricity people charge, uh, uh, pay for it. So that's another area which is controversial. But in my mind, uh, uh, the industrialized countries can give a lead by simply uh, having a carbon tax. And you know, in principle, if they had a carbon tax and then imposed a border, an equivalent border tax on imports from developing, from any country that doesn't have a, a reasonable carbon tax, I mean, that would make a big difference. Of course, if they do that, I would like them to think of the IMF's proposal, which would be graded so that a little bit, the burden is less on the developing countries than on the developed countries. I think, you know, clearly getting rid of energy subsidies has to be, has to be a part of the problem. And unfortunately, at least in India, we have for long had a very long tradition of keeping energy prices low for uh, vulnerable groups of citizens, whether they are low income urban households or farmers. You know, frankly, converting that into a straight cash transfer and having a sensible carbon price, the obvious solution. I mean, in that sense, I think what the UK has done a few days ago, I mean, announcing uh, an absolute sum uh, to a common sum to all households to offset the rise in energy prices, the right thing to do instead of holding prices down artificially. So you're giving an absolute subsidy, which is common across all households. Now, these are totally new things, uh, but they are now feasible. And many of the uh, changes in uh, digital technology, et cetera, that certainly in India are happening, make it possible. So I think if all of these things were to be put together, uh, we would certainly make significant progress in financing the transition. It may not be at the scale and the level and the pace that is needed. But you know, I think this is an area where if we can get action in the next five years with a bit of a hope of technology coming in to make the change that much more easy, then I think you'll be able to build up the, the base later. But I mean, if nothing happens, then we are in the world that Nick talked about. Everybody will basically produce the same infrastructure that we've been doing for the last 30 years. And that will lock us in for the next 40 years because this stuff has very long life. Thank you very much indeed, Montek. So we'll come to questions now from the audience. Uh, again, if you're on Zoom, please put it in q and I'm going to start with a couple of questions from our in-person audience. And just to remind the in-person audience that this is recorded, so if you're not supposed to be here and you ask a question, you'll get busted. So, uh, so uh, hands, please. I'll walk over with the microphone and, and let you speak into the phone. So we've got one here and one at the back. Hold on. Um, thank you very much. Um, 
I'd like to come back to a point that Montec made about whole of government approaches and also the public finances. I think it's terribly important to keep in mind that you need sustainable finances at different levels of government in order to unlock the private sector financing. So really the own source revenues are critical in creating uh, clean, compact, connected cities as, as alternatives to you know, the sprawling metropolitan areas. You can't have more people in Mexico City or Jakarta or Mumbai for that matter. So really addressing a just transition requires strengthening subnational finances. Now you can go with the piggyback on a carbon tax, something that Nick Stern and I uh, proposed to the Finance Commission about 12 years ago, but you also need to build on work that Isha did on local taxation and really hear the work that Nick uh, and the tax benefit approaches uh, at the LSE since the late uh, 1970s, you know, emphasize the linkage between taxes and benefits in order to assure just transitions. I know there's been some experimentation in India on different types of property taxes, but I think the just transition involves more research in this area. We have proposals I've been making to, uh, you know, we've had just had three workshops in New Delhi with the World Bank, and it builds on work we've been doing on China and Mexico, and also for COP27. So I'd be very happy to discuss some of these issues, but I think really taking the whole of government approach, you're looking at also addressing failures, for example, with multilateral support, like with the HIPIC program, which did not adequately address governance issues, which is what do local governments do and how the financing is uh, short, and also what happens to the monies. So really what you're looking at is an institutional governance set of issues together with the tax issues at different levels of government. So I think it's important, I think also a lot of work at uh, GRI on private finances is to understand that the public finances are critical. Efe Shah Mahmoud, I think I'm still at GRI, but I'm not 100% sure. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much, Efe Shah. And our second question here, please say your name. Thank you. I'm Francis Heil from Atkins, a principal engineer in climate change and resilience. Um, and I work with a number of the multilateral development banks and countries, um, as we've been mentioning today. Um, and probably adding a little bit on the on the point made there around governance and enhanced, enhancing governance is required because we've touched on the constraints with finance. Um, something I see from working with the multilateral development banks and with developing countries, and even within the UK, um, in my country as well, in Australia, where I'm from, is uh, constraints in capacity and understanding in, in developing investments, in appraising projects, in delivering uh, action on the ground. Um, so capacity constraints within the bank to understand what is good investment, what is sustainable investment. Um, Danae mentioned things like taxonomies and there's systems that are being implemented there to enhance um, how banks and how lenders are um, using finance and allocating it to sustainable directions but I wanted about your, your thoughts there on capacity constraints because that also takes there's a there's a lag period there of upskilling people upskilling workforces um, as well so it's not just a technology technological constraint and a financial constraint that, that I often see thank you let me just walk back up to the front to give Montek the microphone thanks very much um, Good, very good points. Um, let me take them in reverse order. Uh, on the capacity issue, I completely agree with you that, you know, that's not just for the local and state governments, but just reflecting the complexity of economic uh, challenges. I personally think that we do not adequately uh, recognize how much more complex economic uh, policy making has become. So as a general rule, uh, we ought to be doing a lot more to build capacity. I'm speaking about India, since I know more about it, but I'm sure it's true uh, generally. Now, you know, here too, in certain specialized areas, central banking and so on, usually there is a kind of a, a, a global community. They all know what's happening and probably the gap between uh, 
what happens in a developing country and what happens in a developed country is much less uh, because these are very elite institutions. Maybe that's also a little bit true of finance ministries, although there it's more most true of central banks because they are a, a tribe apart and they know what each other are doing. But you know, I think um, uh, to my mind, it's not the lack of capacity that's a problem. I think we need to realize that we need to develop it. So I think it's the political direction that this is what we've got to do. And I'm pretty clear, uh, at least it should be true of an economy like India, that once the government decides that it needs need to do something in this area, it's not difficult to get capacity. I mean, after all, uh, take the payment system. I mean, generally the, the UPI, which has been introduced as a payment system is widely described as being world-class. There was no lack of capacity that made it possible. Just a decision that this is how, what we got to do. So I think that that's probably going to be very much true uh, in the whole energy transition. I mean, take a very simple point. Uh, I mentioned the, the, the business that uh, our distribution companies uh, don't have very strong finances. Now, this is not just a problem because we want renewable energy. This will actually be a problem if we want even conventional energy, because it's not as if people are going to be willing to expand conventional energy capacity, but have doubts about renewable because the technology is uncertain. I mean, if there's a payments risk, we will just not be able to develop energy to support the kind of growth we want, whatever the energy. And of course, we shouldn't be developing the conventional energy. What this means is that the management of the electricity market, that is the local at state level regulation, has to be made pretty much world class. The transition we are going, unlike elsewhere, where we were basically building a system that other countries had built 50 years ago. Here we're building a system that nobody else has got at the moment. I don't think the percentage of renewable electricity in Britain is not more than about 30%, right? And we're talking about making renewables 65 to 70%. So how to handle uh, an electricity market with that scale of renewable energy is a frontier a technology area, and I hope uh, that somehow our system uh, gears up to get the kind of expertise we need to build sophisticated markets that can handle that. And this example can be replicated uh, across the board. So, so much is very important, and I think we need to do that. On Etisham's point, I mean, you're absolutely right that on, I think probably any indicator uh, would show that we do not devolve enough to the local level. And certainly in the case of property taxes, although the property taxes, the revenue of the property tax should fill the coffers of the local authority, the rate at which it is charged is decided by the state government. So you, you don't have a, a, a basic competition where a local authority says, look, I'm going to charge you more, but I'm going to provide first rate services and if you want to migrate to some other place, do so. And the rate is lower, but the services are lousy. I mean, here you have a political system where it's easy to lower property rates uh, because the people who suffer are the local authorities that just don't get enough money. And I've seen some numbers. India's property rate, I mean, the revenue from urban property taxation in India is something like one fifth of as a percent of GDP or what it should be in a country like that. Uh, you know, nobody, uh, it's very difficult to say, well, let's raise the tax rate five times. But if you realize that uh, the, the first thing they have to realize is it can't all come from the state government or the central government. I mean, if you really want decent drainage systems and you don't want to have flooded streets, you have to pay higher property taxes. It shouldn't be too difficult to do that because after all, we are also an unequal society. So the property taxes would be paid by the more wealthy, but somehow it hasn't done it. They haven't done that. And you're right, Isha used to lobby, but you know, the lobbying in India is very often, why don't you devolve more resources to the local government? That's not the, now the most recent finance commission, the 15th finance commission in its report says, that you know, property talk tax rates should be raised, but I'm not aware that anyone's done it. I don't know, maybe Tamil Nadu has done something, but 
these things are now getting into the debate in some ways. I mean, I think if I look back in the last 20 years, too much of economic policy discussions were focused at the central government level, whereas actually almost 50% of actions that affect welfare are really taken at the state government level. Hmm? All locally. All, all local. Yeah, right. You're right. You're talking about even lower than state government. So that's a very important. So you better, uh, whatever you can do to increase awareness of this would be helpful. Thank you very much indeed. Our audience on Zoom seems to be a bit shy at the moment. So we're going to take another couple of questions from the in-person audience. So hands up if you would like to ask a question. Just wait for me to come forward. Please a reminder to uh, say who you are. Hi there, uh, <clears throat> Nick Godfrey um, from the Grantham Institute. Um, two questions, one to um, Montet Singh. Congratulations on your book. Um, Nick mentioned before the importance of finance ministers. So my question to you is, if you were in the elevator with the India, Indian Minister of Finance, what would you say to him in terms of encouraging um, a strengthening of the role of finance ministries on the climate agenda? And I guess a related question to Nick, I'd love to get your perspective, Nick, on how do you, um, what type of capabilities and skills do you think that finance ministries will now need to build um, to fulfill this enhanced and strengthened role? Thank you. And do we have any other questions? Otherwise, I'm going to exercise chair's privilege to ask a question. I'm going to do that. So uh, one of the other things that has happened since uh, you wrote this chapter was that uh, Australia have elected a new government under Anthony Albanese, who is a, a major exporter of coal to India. So do you have a message for the Labour government? They seem a little bit unsure about what their policy on coal should be, uh, but it does very much depend on its exports. So do you have a message about what the prospects are for India import, continuing to import large volumes of coal from Australia into the future? Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> well, that's what I call a very micro level question. But let me say that um, it's quite clear to me that if we're going to phase out uh, coal-based power, and this was much discussed in Glasgow, and India was, I think, unfairly criticized for not being willing to commit to a phasing out. And so we negotiated it into a phasing down. Mind you, that itself, in my view, is a huge improvement because it's not easy for anyone in India to talk about phasing out from coal because it employs a million people. So actually, if we phase it down, that would be progress. And in any case, uh, that process will take place during the 30s. It's not a it's not an, because you know there's a lot of coal-based capacity currently being built, and obviously it's not intended that it shouldn't operate. But there's no question that India should, in the medium term, be getting away from imports. Uh, as a matter of fact, we have coal. We should get out of even domestic mining of coal. But the first, if you like, supply uh, 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 source that would feel the brunt of any impact to get away from coal would be imports. Now, what that does to the Australian coal industry, I don't know, uh, but India is only one importer. I would hope, by the way, that around the world, uh, people realize that uh, while every coal mine is not going to be shut down in a very short time, the fact is by mid-century, there shouldn't be a future for coal. At least nothing, nothing more than what can be handled through carbon capture and storage. Now, of course, if somebody invents a highly efficient form of carbon capture and storage, well, you can keep using, although even there, I think gas would be better than coal. So the general market signal has to be negative, but mind you, markets have systematically ignored these signals. I think it was Mark Carney, when he was governor of the Bank of England, several years ago, he said that, look, it is very clear that if the earth is not going to burn, 50% of the known fossil fuel reserves at that time should never be mined. And since then, I think they've increased. But markets don't seem to reflect that in the value they place on these, uh, these companies. So it's a tough question. There's a question from 
about elevate if you were in the elevator. Ah, like elevator. Elevators. You know, I mean, the, the very limited commitments I made to good health was never to use the elevator. So <laughs> I, I did have many opportunities to talk to finance ministers, constantly giving them whatever advice. But you know, on the issue of capacity, I would really advise all finance ministers to recognize, not just the Indian one. The advice they normally get is filtered through civil servants. Many civil servants are very knowledgeable, but most are not. Very few are at the frontier of what would challenge their own uh, prejudices. So a finance minister would be well advised to constantly ask, is this the best advice that I'm getting, whatever it is. And you know, we have in the past uh, had mechanisms of setting up expert committees uh, which bring in experts from the private sector, uh, from academia, and so on. And I think as we move into these whole of the economy transitions, we need to do a lot more of that. And I mean, if you do that, uh, it's not that the civil service would object, uh, but you would at least get a ventilation of ideas, which would then be looked at and put before government. So there's no reason why that can't be done. Okay, we're approaching the end of our event, so I'm going to a offer quick, uh, an opportunity for each of the discussants. A, oh. the, just a question quickly for me. Yeah, yeah I know I'm going to okay. sum up at the sure. end. Um, but Nick asked about uh, the uh, skills in the finance ministries. Um, I think it would be around investment in its finance, and they couldn't do that alone, as uh, Montek said. Um, but I think it's true of most finance ministries around the world I think including our own here in the UK, that the people there don't know much about investment. They've never made uh, investments. They've never sat on the loan committee of uh, a bank. So I would encourage them uh, to reach out and to partner with the private sector, but also themselves learn much more about the investment processes and how to finance them so that they're a better partner. Okay, well, I'm going to offer you the opportunity now to sum up as well. <laughs> so, um, it was a very rich discussion, and, and thank you. Thank you again, uh, Montek, and, and uh, thank you to uh, Danai and Mike, and from whom, uh, as ever, I, I learnt from their uh, contrib contributions. Let, let me start with the investment and then go on to its finance, because that's what we're talking about. But absolutely at the heart of all this is investment we're talking about investment for transition and investment of course and innovation for transition i think we are settling down on the numbers if you put the paper that uh, amar led together with the work that uh, mike uh, hemsey and his team have been doing that um, ia have been doing you know the approaches have been a bit different in different cases but essentially, we're talking about an increase in investment from current levels of, um, as Mike said, about three trillion for the world as a whole, emerging markets, uh, excluding developing economies, uh, perhaps a, a couple of trillion if you include adaptation. Those, those are the ballparks. And um, we've seen what kind of investment is necessary, and both Mike and uh, Montek set that uh, set that out. Um, the conditions for that investment are fundamental. And there we talked about the investment climate, the country platform, with a particular focus in this case on uh, electricity and the conditions for investment in electricity, particularly in India's case, the role of the uh, distribution companies at the state level, but also more generally, as uh, Montek emphasized, the um, uh, the overall transmission system as well. Um, but if the private sector is going to invest in generation, it's got to have the investment climate where it sees reasonable returns from that uh, investment. So the conditions for investment are of fundamental importance and the credibility of those conditions, the long-term nature of the environment in which people can make those uh, private investments. We then turn to the finance of that investment. Um, if you take the number of two trillion for emerging market and developing economies, that, that by 2030, that would include something for adaptation and natural capital. Um, 
and you say maybe half internal, half external, or 60, 40, but we don't know exactly, but you know, somewhere in that uh, region, you're talking about uh, a trillion uh, extra of internal finance and a trillion extra of external finance, all for the process of development within which the, trans, the, uh, the drive to net zero uh, occurs. Well, clearly, if you're going to have a, a trillion extra of internal finance, just as the external finance, the big majority will be private, but a very substantial fraction will be public. So domestic resource mobilization is a critical part of this, uh, of this whole story. And as Eti Sham emphasized, at the various levels of, uh, of, of government and local capital markets, as Danai emphasized uh, very strongly. But that does leave the extra trillion flow from uh, the international side, or many um, hundreds of billions, but probably ballpark uh, trillion. Again, you know, maybe two thirds private and one third or three quarters private and one quarter public, but you're, you're talking really about uh, a few hundred billion coming from the uh, international public, the big bulk of which would be the multilateral development uh, banks. So what we have to do here in order to try to win this argument is get that simple logic of the scale of investment, the nature of uh, investment, uh, the conditions for the investment and how it's financed. Because that basic logic does take you immediately to the kinds of numbers we've been talking about. And most of us have had a crack at it. As I said, whether it's the Energy Transition Commission or team led by AMAR or the IEA, or, you know, we're coming up with the same kinds of numbers and we're coming up with the same kinds of priorities for investment, of course, with the, the big expansion of clean electricity being absolutely the heart of it all. So I think uh, getting action is getting, it requires shared understanding and I think we're moving towards it and this paper is an extremely important part of generating that shared understanding. The cost of capital has to be centre stage, Dan I rightly made that central to her discussion. You can't finance all this on eight, nine, ten percent real for long-term infrastructure. It ain't going to work. So what we're talking about is bringing these different sources of finance together so that you get the cost of capital. In different places, of course, it's going to be different because this is a heterogeneous story, but you've got to bring that cost of capital down. And for the just transition, you're going to have to make that cost of capital close to zero for many parts of that story. It's not the big bulk of the finance, but it's an important and necessary part of the uh, finance. And that's all about managing risk, assessing, reducing, uh, assessing, reducing, and uh, sharing and managing the risk. That's uh, central. There were some particular points. I fully agree with Mike about coal and deforestation being center stage, even though, um, for new investments uh, in most parts of the world, the renewable is unambiguously cheaper than the, than, the, than the fossil fuel. It's still true that for a plant that's in existence, the variable cost will be in many cases lower than the uh, cost of building new. And those are the cases where you've got to work out how to uh, phase out. But the two priorities for me, for the voluntary carbon market, and I hope for others, driving past coal, and uh, avoiding deforestation and encouraging forestation. Those would be the two top priorities, uh, I think. Within that context, we didn't say much about biodiversity and natural capital, but it was within, I think, uh, everybody's minds as they were speaking. That has to be a very big part of the story. India, I think, in particularly well-placed all the way from the, the mangroves to the wonderful national parks, and there's so much potential for increasing India's uh, natural capital to the great benefit of India and uh, to the uh, world. Finally, we talked about the politics of uh, all this. This is a, a, a moment where the international situation is fractious by anybody's uh, standards. But I think if you look at where we can come together, actually climate biodiversity is an area where you have a remarkable amount of agreement. And if you have a fractious world, 
Uh, you can't just go around telling people not to be so fractious. That's not going to help very much. But if you can find an area on which you can collaborate, and we can, you know, 190 some countries were there in Paris, you know, same number of countries there in uh, Glasgow, uh, a joint US-China statement in Glasgow. I wonder how many other subjects you get a joint US-China uh, statement, and it was quite positive. Um, it, the the the, uh, the speech by Prime Minister Modi was was path breaking. It sets a new model of development for India. And, you know, it, it spoke about net zero by 2070, but the other of the other four of the five in the list were for 2030 and uh, showed the sense of urgency and the this decade approach, which Montague, you, you rightly uh, emphasize. Of course, you have to look at this decade in the context of what's likely to come after, but to focus on action now, I think is very important. And that's exactly what Prime Minister Modi did. So working with uh, Indonesia and India and, and Brazil, but I think, particularly India next year, from the point of view of, of who and what India is and the timing of it all, I think is particularly important. Some of us will be working with Germany on this year's G G7, obviously important to, to push on Japan as well. And to pick up, I think, on the conversation which Janet Yellen opened in her Atlantic Council speech as well. So thank you, Montek and uh, Arinda again. And uh, thank you, um, Kamya and Bob again, and to than I and, uh, and and Mike. Um, I enjoyed it greatly and uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.